Thank you, guys. We're going to start off with a question for you this morning, which is, what did you expect when you came to church today? What were your expectations as you walked in, and what were you thinking about and hoping for, and Were you expecting to hear some good music, to listen to a communicator that you can agree with or disagree with? And you know that most fights are really about unmet expectations, that if you boiled it down, You could just say the answer to this fight is, I had this expectation, they had that expectation, and that expectation went unmet. And out of our expectations might come what we receive. And when we walk into a place and we expect one thing, that maybe that's all that we get out of it. But Jeremiah 29 12, not, not 11. 11 is really good. You remember 11? For I know the plans I have for you to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. It's beautiful, right? But the ver- verse right after that says that what's important is that you seek and find the Lord with all of your heart. And that if you do, that you will find him. And so the expectation is elevated when we talk about what we do here at church. And in 13 it says that that God will listen to you. And if God is perfect, then he is the perfect listener. Now, I, I have some friends. My wife's a therapist. She's a pretty good listener, which I like. And people pay a lot of money just so that somebody out there will listen to them. But imagine if God in heaven is so good at listening that he can hear what is on your heart and what is on your mind right now as he's present here with us in this moment and that you have access to him. In 1 John, John concludes this amazing uh, few chapters with these words. Let's see if I can find them here. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything in accordance with his will, he hears us. And so as we prepare our hearts this morning, let's pray and know that God hears us and that if we believe in him, if we believe in the Son of God, that he wants us to give the good gifts that he has for us. So let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for your presence. I thank you that you've come to meet with us in this place, that you were there when we woke up this morning, and you will be there as we leave. And we bring ourselves to you asking that you would take our lives, um, the, the ordinary everydayness of our lives, and that you would show us 
how your kingdom can be made manifest through every day, through each moment, through the next breath of a second chance and a fresh wind. So move and shape us as we learn from you and your scripture and your example this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Will you turn with me, if you can, or follow along on the screens? We're going to be in March, Mark chapter 6 this morning, verse 30. So hear these words. It says, the, apostle gathered around, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was five thousand. So we're going to work through some of the big points in this amazing story today of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And one of the first points is actually found in reading the section before, because the section before is really about Jesus receiving some bad news, that John the Baptist has just been killed. He's been beheaded by Herod. And you remember in that story that there's this great banquet, and there's dancing, and there's food, and then in some really twisted form of entertainment, John is brought in and killed for the pleasure of that group. And so then Jesus receives this news that his forerunner, the one who gave him his disciples, is now passed away. So this must have been sad news, a difficult thing for him to learn and to hear. And so his desire then is to take his disciples who had been doing a lot of ministry and had been very busy and to go off to a solitary place to be alone. And whenever we encounter these moments in scripture, we learn that God, who had three years to do everything he was going to do, made flesh in Jesus, took some time to rest. It's always good to pause and remember. Are you taking time to rest Parents, are you taking time to rest? Do you have moments where you can find a solitary place to just be with God? If you receive bad news that grieves your soul, are you taking time to rest, 
to spend time with God, to bring to him whatever is on your heart. And so he invites the disciples to go, but really this story is not about getting to a solitary place, right? Because Jesus is interrupted. He's on his way, he's on the boat to a solitary, quiet place, right? He's going for a little mini sabbatical, and then what happens? The the crowds see him on a boat with his disciples, and they run, They run to where they think he's going, and they get there before him. And isn't it incredible that a lot of Jesus' teaching and ministry is on the way? He's going somewhere else. He has another goal in mind, another objective. He's gotten his disciples together, and he's told them, well, the goal right now is to go rest, but then he's completely interrupted. Jesus is constantly going somewhere else, and then this burning bush appears in front of him, somebody, some issue that has some kind of need, and he has the presence of mind to pay attention. And really causes him to stop and to pay attention to this crowd who's disrupting his solitude and silence, something I probably would be tempted to not do, is his compassion. He looks upon them, and he has compassion for them. He sees their desire to want to learn from him and be with him. And he feels their needs and the things that are on their heart. So he decides he's going to stop and pay attention. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be a disciple in that situation? You get up in the morning, in your posse, in your clique, right, is God made flesh through Jesus. And you're hanging with him. You get up in the morning. He says, we're going one place. All of a sudden, you think you're going to solitude and rest. All of a sudden, you got 5,000 men, probably 10,000 people in front of you, And he's there teaching them, teaching them for so long that it's starting to get dark outside. Now, if I kept you here for that long, I think you'd have the same question that they had, which is, when's lunch? When is dinner? Got some real practical needs here that needs to be met. I can only listen for so long. And you know, one of the ways we can describe if like, and and, and in church tradition, this way of being in the world for these disciples who had ordinary, everyday lives, just like ours as fishermen, but then when the king of the kingdom came to earth, he then caused all of these wild adventures right in the same places where they were fishermen, lived their ordinary, you know, wonderful lives. Now they're on adventure with God. They don't know where they're going. They don't know where they'll end up. But they know when they wake up in the morning, something's going to happen. They're going to learn something. They're going to grow. They may make mistakes. But God is going to make this day count through Jesus. Jesus has some adventures for us to go on. You know, the the church tradition calls this uh, movement of the Holy Spirit like a wild goose chase. That's where that phrase comes from, where uh, the the monks in Ireland began to have that as their symbol, the wild goose, because they never knew where God would take them in their everyday, ordinary lives. And part of what the amazing secret behind that is, is that it's on the way. Because so often we have our job or our main goal day, and it's easy for us to miss the present moment that we're in, the moment when we're on the way to work or on the way to family or whatever it is, that we miss the people around us. We miss our Uber driver or we miss the person in line with us or we miss the the stranger walking by. We miss people that are in distress but aren't showing it all the time. Because we're on the way. We got stuff to do. We wear busyness like a badge of honor on our chest. 
But Jesus has a whole reframing of what happens when you begin to see all of your on the way as opportunity. And he really reframes it when he tells the disciples after they express this need, he says, guess what, guys? I know you came to me, but I'm sending you. He's like, you need to learn how to participate in the life of the kingdom. And so he says, you go give them to eat. And they did what most of us would do. They looked at the, spread, the Excel spreadsheet and they looked at what they had and they said, well, uh, Jesus, sorry, that's not in the budget this year. There's no supermarket. There's no, not even been a supermarket invented yet. Where are we going to get all this food from that you're telling us to do this? And then Jesus does an incredible reframe for them. He asks them a question. Well, what do you have? And then he says, go and see. And the reframe there is to say, okay, so the disciples were focused on what they lacked. They said, I don't know what we got, but we know we don't have enough. That's for sure. God, Jesus, what you're calling us to do, we just don't have enough of it. We can't do it, so you told us to do something we can't do. This is an impossible task. You ever been there? I am not enough. Jesus, what you're calling me to do, how can I be enough for this situation? And we feel our lack, don't we? We, we can get in those ways of thinking where we, we just think about what we do not have and what the world needs, and we get so focused on that. But Jesus says, okay, but maybe shift your perspective and look at what is it that you do have. In essence, he's saying, go and see. Can you put on kingdom of God glasses? Can you look at what is there in light of the kingdom of God and see in a wholly new way? How I wish the world could see through kingdom of God glasses and that each of us could put ours on. You know, we think about people that are really amazing in our culture, right? I think about somebody like Anthony Bourdain. uh, This person that people really admired and respected and saw as really talented and capable leader. And the world saw the gifts of this man, but he somehow could not see himself this way. He was looking through the lens of depression instead of kingdom of God glasses. Or I think about our precious young people that so often feel anxious and they don't they're not sure of themselves and where they fit in the big scary world and i want to give them those kingdom of god glasses and so they could see the way we see them right so full of life and potential and the future and the now of the kingdom of god And we could go on down the list of the ways in which it would change the way we see if we put on our kingdom of God glasses. That's the invitation from Jesus, right? He says, go and be. And then our church's saint this morning, St. Andrew, he actually, I believe, provides the secret ingredient here that we haven't gotten to. Because Andrew's only mentioned three times in the Bible, okay? So yeah, I know, it's only three. We named our church after him, but he's in the Bible. He made it. But the three times he is mentioned in Scripture, he goes three for three, which last time I checked is a good batting average. And each time what he does 
is a simple, wonderful thing. He meets Jesus, and he goes, and he gets this guy, Peter, and he says, Peter, you need to meet Jesus. That's his role. In John chapter 6, in the telling, the feeding of the 5,000 gospel story there, it says that Andrew is the one who brought the little boy with these loaves and fish, and he brought him to Jesus. And then later in the gospel, it says that Andrew is third time, there's a Gentile, meaning you and I, that needed to know about Jesus, and so he brought the Gentiles in order to meet Jesus. I like this example. It takes a workout for us, right? It's just recognizing who is with you. The reframe was, what do I have and who am I with? That he would make such a request of us. Who are we with? So often we only look at ourselves with the lens of scarcity and not enoughness. And this is asking us to say, where are your loaves and fish? Those things that I gave you. These gifts that I gave you. Will you see in light of the kingdom of God and understand who your king is and what he can do? And so Jesus takes those loaves of fish, right? And he looks up to heaven and he gave thanks to God And then they were multiplied, and everyone's belly was full on that day. And they learned that Jesus is enough. Just as we contemplated on today, that when we have Jesus, we have. And the, the, the part of the story that I really want to think upon in these last moments is a part of the story where Jesus asks a question. Because, did you know, Jesus asks about 307 questions in the Gospels. And somewhere around 120 questions are asked of him. And he only answers like three of them directly. Because Jesus is an incredible question asker. He wants to hear from you and he wants to shape your perspective. And so I have just a list of 10 questions that I want to ask you this morning that are words of scripture from Jesus. And sometimes we think about questions from Jesus with a certain posture. If we read it, it's like, go and see how many do you have. Are you worrying? Right? It's that feeling of condescension. Oh, I'm Jesus, you're just some regular people. can never do what I do. And we feel that voice, but that, that's not a Jesus voice. Like if we think of who Jesus is in light of this cross, he willfully gave up his life, humbled himself, and that they, they even put a crown of thorns of mockery on him. The one who came to lower himself and to suffer on our behalf is not the one who comes to condescend. He's the one who comes to ask us the questions to help us see through kingdom of God eyes. And so let me ask 
these questions. Let Jesus ask these questions. Who of you, by worry, can add a single hour to his or her life? Why are you so afraid? What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? What do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep, and one of them wanders away? Will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hill and go to look for the one that wandered off? Who do you say that I am? For who is greater, the one seated at the table or the one who serves? What do you want me to do for you? Do you realize what I have done for you? Do you love me? Can you imagine if our heroes of the faith were only invited to see from their flaws, from the ways in which they fall short. This list would look like something like this. Abraham was way too old to do anything of significance. Elijah ran for his life and was suicidal, fleeing from Queen Jezebel. Joseph was just a victim of abuse from his family. Job went bankrupt, lost everything that he had in this world, and was a total failure. Moses was supposed to lead a nation of people, but he couldn't even give a good speech. Gideon was racked with doubt and fear, and even talking to God, questioned God. The Samaritan woman was divorced and saw that she had nothing to offer. Noah was just drunk. Even though he had this amazing experience with God, the next moment... He was drunk and naked. Jeremiah was too young. Didn't know enough about sure yet to do anything of real impact. Jacob was a cheater. David, a murderer. Jonah ran from God, given a mission. He ran the complete other way. Peter denied Christ three times, betraying the one he loved the most. But now we put the kingdom of God lens on it. Abraham goes from being old to the father of nations. Elijah goes from being suicidal to calling on the fire of heaven. Joseph goes from being a victim of abuse to one who rose... to lead the entire empire of uh, of Egypt to save his people Israel. Job proved to be faithful through everything and answered the question, what happens when bad things happen to good people? Moses parted the Red Sea with his staff and liberated the Israelites. Gideon was victorious in battle. The Samaritan woman may have been divorced, but she was a credible evangelist who shared the good news of Jesus with her whole town. Noah was a drunk, but he also saved every living creature on earth. Jeremiah was young, but he had the fortitude to be the only one in his time to speak truth to power in a way no one had seen before. Jacob might have been a cheater, but he also wrestled with God and won, took on the name Israel. David was a murderer, yet he was the forerunner, and his ancestors produced Jesus himself, the Messiah Jesus, out of that kingly line. Jonah ran from God, yet he was able to preach and save even his enemies. 
Peter denied Christ three times, yet he was given the keys to the kingdom of God. How do you look at yourself and the world around you? Have you put on your kingdom of God glasses yet and taken those loaves and fish and realize that when you roll with Jesus, it's enough? Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you are the great multiplier. So I pray that you would align our will with your will. And that you would teach us how to ask for the good things that you have to offer us. Lord, I pray for those who are hearing the voice to go and see. That you would call on them and they would answer. And that you would show them that a life in the kingdom of God is worth living. We thank you, Lord, that you are taking care of every person in this room. Thank you for the daily bread and the everyday ordinary things placed in your hands that become life marked and shaped as your people, as priests and priestesses, a holy nation, a people called out for your purposes in this place. God, we thank you that you're with us. In your loving, gracious, and wonderful name, we pray. Amen. Will you stand and let's sing together?